popular culture. I love popular culture. My master's thesis was on reality television. I am in American Culture Studies Department, which is very closely linked to the popular culture department at BGSU, which was founded by Ray Brown, as I stated above. Um, we are currently still the only popular culture department there is. Uh, Ray Brown was one of the first scholars that people actually listened to when they said, hey, popular culture is worth studying because it's what the masses consume. Um, there are popular culture courses um, and maybe tracks in different fields and whatnot in different universities. But BGSU still holds the honor of being the only po official popular culture studies department. Um, I personally think we can learn a lot from popular culture and we actually have an introduction to popular culture course in this school and so I obviously could not cover all of that in this one module but what I can do is kind of show you some ways in which popular culture aligns with and reveals things about things we've already learned throughout this course. Um, so you'll notice after I give you in this video here an overview of some major theories about why pop culture matters that can kind of help frame our thinking throughout the rest of the module. Um, the rest of the module will basically be a choose your own adventure for the most part. You will get to pick what you read based off of what you've read before. Sound good? Okay. Um, so uh, it might mean there's a bit more reading than usual. Um, obviously, we're, we're learning how to consume kind of like a larger amount of text as we go on. Um, but I really just kind of want you to get the main points from each of the readings. What is it that they're talking about? How does it build off of what you're learning in this course? How does it build off of what you're learning in this module specifically? Um, so first, I wanted to give you kind of a an overview, as I said, of pop culture theory. Um, so let me see. You have Althusser, Louis Althusser. I have a link to him below in his ideological state apparatus. Althusser was a French philosopher who had this idea that we control the masses um, through various state apparatuses and the ideological state apparatus is specifically that which is centered on entertainment and mass communication entertainment and mass communication such as um, journalism and nowadays that would be like social media and TV and films and all the things that maybe didn't exist when Althusser was writing. Um, but he had this idea that, you know, the people who controlled those narratives, the people who controlled those outlets, the ways that we communicate with each other, the ways that we um, view images and the things we see, that the narratives that they produced were how we saw the world, right? They created how we view the world. Um, and that is based off of this idea of ideology. If you'll notice in the title, ideological state apparatus, ideology essentially means the way that we interact with the world and view it and understand it that is shared with others. And that is the key aspect of ideology, that we share this view of the world and our relationships to it with others. So this could be an ideology held by a community or a nation. Um, for instance, capitalism is considered an ideology. It is a way of understanding how the world works and how people relate to each other or should relate to each other. Um, so Althusser had this idea that governing bodies and entertainment media, they're the ones with the control here and they're the ones who are kind of giving us specific ideas about the world. Um, this is really built on by uh, Adorno and Horkheimer, who I also include below. They really focus on advertising and marketing. And they say that the advertising and marketing industries essentially create identities for us and create needs in us to consume things in order to kind of indulge what we believe to be our identities. So for instance, you know, the way we dress, right? Um, marketing and advertising suggest, you know, if you are this kind of person, you dress this way, right? And so it creates this need, oh, I wanna be that kind of person, so I need to dress that way. It also creates more, um, I guess, obvious needs in us, right? Um, think of refrigeration. Refrigeration was advertised as something that could just help 
help you not have to curate your meats, right? <laughs> you didn't have to hang things up in salt. Um, it helped things last longer, um, but it, be it became a need, right? Just like cell phones eventually became a need. Um, marketing and advertising is what Adorno and Horkheimer believe what are what create that need. And therefore, what they believed is that advertising and marketing created us into kind of mindless drones that consume whatever mar marketing and advertising execs tell us to consume. Um, which is an interesting aspect and it influences a lot of how we understand advertising and marketing these days. Um, I actually read a really interesting book, The Conquest of Cool. I'm not linking it below. You can feel free to look up if look it up if you want, The Conquest of Cool. Um, in which Thomas Frank kind of looks at the marketing strategies of advertising agencies in the 60s and how they not only like referred to, you know, what mainstream culture thought was cool, but in an effort to stay current with youth, they decided to, um, like, I guess, co-opt resistance and start selling products by advertising it as like resistance products, which is something we still see today. I mean, and they, of course, had a lot of snafus. I mean, just look at, uh, I don't know if you guys remember that Pepsi commercial where Kendall Jenner, like, walks at she's like at a shoot and then she sees a protest this apparently like just a super boring protest they're all just sitting there with vague signs about god knows what there's no real message she hands a security officer a pepsi and the world is a beautiful place again <laughs> and a lot of people had a problem with them really like watering down and subsuming protest in order to sell a soda like what does soda have to do with protest right and so um there are snafus in that right that doesn't always work um but it's interesting how there are these theories that you know it can however advertising can end up subsuming subcultures which is what dick hebdige talks about because he doesn't completely believe that marketing and advertising create mindless drones he believes they can but he also believes that there are subcultures that can actually subvert those mainstream norms um he only looks at like british subcultures like the mods and the punks and the rockers but it's still an interesting concept that um, even if we're working within these ideological state apparatuses, we also still have the possibility of resisting norms, even if those, that resistance is eventually co-opted by advertising companies. <laughs> um, we can see a lot of examples of how um, pop culture studies and understanding of how pop culture influence how we relate to the world around us um, in all kinds of different fields. Uh, one really well-known example is Laura Mulvey's work um, in visual narrative where she talks about the male gaze and she basically says that film has been created um, always catering to the male gaze and what she means by this is that it's always catering to this idea of women as objects as sexualized objects as disembodied body parts on the screen never really complete human beings with their own flaws and their own well-developed characters um, never the protagonist um, and always um, identify creating a male protagonist that people can identify with because she kind of argues that because we're all raised with these images in film and we're all, you know, film is always catering to the male gaze, we all learn to identify with the male gaze and to identify with the male protagonists and therefore is very difficult for us to identify with films that don't do that, that don't cater to the male gaze. Um, which is interesting given, you know, the backlash against the diversification of the Star Wars cast. Um, I, there are a lot of examples and where I would say Mulvey might still be pretty relevant in that particular aspect. Um, if you're not so sure what objectification is, that word that I mentioned, uh, Lacey Green gives a pretty good definition of it as well as explanation of its effects in the video that I linked below. Um, she is a public and women's health care um, master's student that I follow on YouTube. I think she's pretty cool. You might like her. Um, but if we're going to think about why popular culture can have these kinds of effects, it might help us to move backward and think in terms of like cognitive 
workings in psychology. How do we think? So um, one really good source for that is Walter Fisher. Those of you who are familiar with psychology might be familiar with his um, rational world paradigm and his narrative world paradigm. Um, his rational world paradigm says that, you know, we have two different ways of thinking. First off, we think in logic. Secondly, we think in stories um, and that the stories that we are told again and again and again are the ones that we internalize and believe to be the true story. And we have kind of lose our ability to think logically when something doesn't match with the stories that we're familiar with. Um, which is a really interesting concept. Um, I love the idea that we think in stories um, and it can really have an interesting impact on how we interact with the world, right? If, you know, we, if we hear a news story that doesn't match what we believe about the world, then we might choose not to believe it or we might restructure the facts in our head. Um, there's a lot of theory on how we structure narratives in popular culture and um, how we reinforce mainstream culture with those narratives or subvert them by creating new narratives. Um, and I have a video below from uh, Dr. Gretchen Busel, a mentor of mine at Texas Women's, um, who actually discusses Walter Fisher's narrative paradigm and the effect it can have. It's a really short video. It was a TEDx talk. She had a very limited amount of time to talk, and she was a little nervous. You can tell. But it, um, I actually think it's pretty brilliant and concise and easy to understand, and it might help you really frame the next readings. Um, as you move through, think about what interests you. Think about what you've already learned and what you'd like to learn more about, and try and put it all together in discussion at the end, all right? As always, if you have any questions or concerns, let me know.